Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, that's July 16th, marks the 75th anniversary of the first nuclear detonation. So this took place as part of the Manhattan Project on July 16th, 1945, and the explosion was a prelude, of course, to the dropping of the atom bombs in August on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's been a lot of commentary about uh, this explosion itself. Uh, Oppenheimer described it, of course, as the, having an equivalent of the brightness of a thousand suns. But this was also the beginning of a very sustained and powerful movement against nuclear weapons. And we have with us Prabir Prakash to talk about it. Prabir, thank you so much for joining us. So could you first talk a bit about the context in which uh, the devil, uh, this took place as well as how the origin of the protest and anti-nuclear movements almost begin from that time itself? So the history of the Manhattan Project is interesting because it starts with, officially, Zillard using Einstein, who was his mentor and who, who, with whom he had worked earlier, to draft, a, to send a letter to Roosevelt, President Roosevelt. And Zillard was worried about the possibility of, uh, after Otto Hahn and others had published a paper about chain reaction, was worried that the Germans would get the nuclear bomb and that would change completely the world that he knew. He was a Hungarian scientist, who was an emigre into the United States. So he was very keen that therefore there should be countervailing uh, at least uh, activities, bomb making, by which it could be balanced and therefore he's approaching Einstein. Einstein was also active in the peace movement in Germany in the First World War. So he had a history of the peace movement and Zillard later all, devoted all his life to the peace movement. So it's a, a, really a tragedy of the first order that these two people who were both constitutionally peaceniks, they were the ones who also become the originators of the idea of the bomb. Not that they were the only ones, but that's the most publicized one because Einstein had that authority and his writing to Roosevelt meant that if it reached Roosevelt, Roosevelt would take it seriously. So that is the origin of the, um, some people would say the Manhattan Project itself because Roosevelt then initiates it then Einstein writes a second letter and that accelerates the development. Then we have finally the formation of the Manhattan Project. And what you said, the July, uh, the, today is the anniversary of that event, that darkness of a thousand suns is what we called it when we did a issue, we actually brought out a booklet uh, on the nuclear bomb and saying why it should not be there the part of our science and peace movement. So this is the background of that. But you know, when Germany surrenders, then Zillard, and Zillard by the time had already fallen out with the general who was commanding the Manhattan Project, General Grove, he had realized that the bomb was not something that was going to be used against Germany. And Germany was not actually in a position to make the bomb. That had become clear that Germany was not really making the bomb. Later on, we learned that Otto Hahn and others hadn't cooperated with Nazi Germany, and therefore they didn't want to really build the bomb. So with that, Zillard was thinking that now the Manhattan Project should not really have the objective of the bomb, when he discovered, and this is what he uh, talked about, that General Grove said that we, this is against the Soviet Union, this is not against Germany. So then he was very worried, how do we prevent the bomb to be dropped then on Japan if it becomes a functional bomb? And on July 16th, we have the uh, demonstration. And on 17th, Zillard then writes a letter to uh, Roosevelt and he's able to reach Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt's wife, who says that she will meet him. But unfortunately, Roosevelt dies. And then Truman becomes the president of the United States. Einstein did write to him. Zillard did meet, not uh, uh, Truman, but he met people that Truman wanted him to meet on this issue. By the time it was clear that the mind had been made up in the United States highest levels, that they would drop the bomb as not as demonstration as Zillard's letter and signed by 74 scientists had written that do a demonstration, give Japan a chance to surrender. And then if it doesn't happen, then think about using it. Don't use it first. But it, by the time it was clear that it was going to be used 
before any demonstration, before de declaring that they had such a bomb, because the objective was not the surrender of Japan. Objective was really the post-war scenario that would emerge, and it was really directed at preeminence of the United States in global uh, scenario, because they would have the bomb and others would not. And they actually calculated this would probably last 10 to 15 years, and this would then allow them to set up the whole post-war uh, scenario in a way that would be advantageous completely to the Western powers, led essentially by the United States. This is the background. And it's also very interesting what you said. This is also the start of the peace movement. Because once the scientific community, who had actually been involved in the Manhattan Project, realized that this was not for deterring Germany, but this now was an instrument of coercion, which was going to be used by others with the sole atomic bomb being in the possession of the United States, they then turn against the bomb completely. And then, of course, Einstein, who was deeply remorseful, as well as Zillard, both of them were deeply remorseful that they had initiated, in some sense, the bomb project. Then team up with others on, the, on how it has to be uh, at least contained, how we can get a position where nuclear weapons would not be used. What could you do for an atomic peace? These then become their objective and Szilard spent the rest of his life uh, as a basically working for the peace movement. He becomes one of the activists of the Pugwash movement, which is, as you know, the scientific community's answer to the bomb, and raises the for, for the first time, all of them put together, raise the question, what is the social responsibility of the scientists? What is called as the uh, Einstein-Russell uh, Manifesto, which was signed by a number of leading scientists from both sides at that point. And this is something that then occupies Einstein, it occupies a whole lot of galaxy of scientific thinkers, as, as well as Zillard, the, in that sense, the originator, if you will, the original mover of the proposal to build the um, atom bomb and therefore the Manhattan Project. So like you pointed out, the US did try to, of course, uh, plan a scenario where they would have a lead for the next 15 to 15 years. And that did not work out because the Soviet Union almost immediately developed the bomb as well. But uh, for the next 20 to 30 years, there was actually a very vibrant, or even 40 years, there was actually a very vibrant movement on these issues. Like you said, scientists were in the forefront of it. Peace movement, science movements were very much leading this issue. But we do see that, especially post the 90s, this has not been so much an issue on uh, in the minds of people, for younger people, for instance, the question of a nuclear holocaust has not really been very much on the top of their minds. So it is also because that this issue over time has kind of moved from the uh, center of people's imagination regarding the future of the world. This is even as the US has a huge number of weapons, it has walked out of treaty six. Well, you know, why the global community is not worried about nuclear weapons anymore is essentially a question I have failed to answer. It is as if, if you have the doomsday threat hanging over your head, after some time, you become immune to it. So you think, okay, it hasn't happened for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, it's not going to happen. So somehow you do not realize how close you have been in the last 70 years for a nuclear exchange. Now, we know that nuclear bombs could have been dropped by accident. A nuclear exchange could have taken place, place by accident. For instance, it is now known that uh, the US detected a flock of geese as a nuclear strike. And it is only because the person concerned who was supposed to monitor this said this can't be true, that the uh, trigger wasn't pressed. Similarly, you had situations where flights are allowed to almost about to take off and somebody stood in front of the aircraft and said, no, this cannot be true. So you've had human interventions to really uh, stop put, pulling the trigger or pushing the trigger, whatever it might be. And this has prevented really an exchange of nuclear weapons when either side were not actually attacking. So it's purely what would be considered as glitches, which led to a possible exchange. And of course, you have the real possibility that somebody may 
may. And if you have a Trump or if you have somebody else, mad enough, may think they can win the nuclear war. So what's the big deal? Let's just destroy them and then we will be, uh, uh, rule over the world. Okay, half of it will be destroyed, no big deal. So even those kind of uh, manic figures might take over the uh, presidency of the country. And with now roughly about 10 countries who have nuclear weapons, the number of uh, people who have control over the trigger and you know the exchange that is required to bring in what would be called a global nuclear winter is not that significant. 25, 30 uh, bombs, that would be enough to set off a cataclysmic event in the, into, for all countries. So the fact that this is not bothering people is also because the United States, and this is really the United States problem, they have said they would like to retain monopoly of nuclear weapons. They are not going to give it up. And if one country doesn't give it up, all the others then say, we also want to have it. We are not going to give it up. And if we look at what North Korea has faced and what, for instance, Serbia or Iraq has faced or what Libya has faced, the fact that uh, they were not invaded, but Serbia was, uh, uh, the Dafis Libya was because they gave up the nuclear option and so was Saddam. So the lesson that people seem to have taken is that if you want really to deter the US, then to have the nuclear weapon is better Otherwise, whatever negotiations you have, you still can attack. And therefore, all the promises made by the United States have no value. And therefore, the final deterrent, the nuclear deterrent, this is the message that you give, tend to give to the world. And that's the reason also you provoke then arms race, not only with Soviet Union, now Russia, or with China, but you also provoke it because a lot of countries then feel that, well, that is the only deterrence the U.S. understands. There is no other deterrence it will accept. And whatever treaties you might re reach with the United States, the next president can tear it up. And that's it. You are back to square one. But you've already conceded a lot of things. For instance, Iran conceded a lot of things on the nuclear program. They probably were not never interested in making a bomb. But they did have a nuclear stockpile of material which could be very quickly converted into fissile material. They had processed it to about 20% uh, purity. After which the step to the 85, 90% purity for weapons grade is not that significant. So giving all of that up, they, they believe that that would secure for them peace back to a certain kind of normalcy in the world. But they're in, you know, in as big a sanctioned regime as they were before they signed all of this, gave up a number of their uh, centrifuges and also their uh, stockpile they had of uranium uh, fissile, uh, uh, not fissile uranium, but pure purified uranium up to about 20%. And that is a significant stockpile they had. So the, the issue therefore is what is the protection that's there against the United States? And that unfortunately, as long as the U.S. believes that it can be the global hegemon and it believes that therefore it needs nuclear weapons as a protection against quote unquote rogue states, I don't think we are going to see a reversal. And because there doesn't seem to be any possibility at the moment for pressurizing the United States, no other country, or they may not be able to rule the world completely, but no other country is in a strategic competition with the US. Therefore, the feeling that nuclear weapons perhaps are here to stay unless we have a strategic parity of some kind. The Russians do have, in terms of destroying the world, they do have strategic parity, but they don't really have the strategic parity in terms of economics, politics, or all the other paraphernalia that goes in the strategic competition. So given that, Unless there is a change in the United States itself against war, and US has, I think, had more than 80 invasions in the last uh, 100 years. So unless that kind of uh, policies change, it's going to be very difficult to build a peace movement. The world's peace movement at that time came because of the threat of mutual annihilation. And it was felt both sides could enter into war, both sides could reciprocate, 
and therefore the need to bring peace and a large part of the European peace movement was okay you have if you want explode bombs against each other but not in Europe and that was one of the reasons that you had a strong peace movement in Europe and now it's just not there. Thank you so much Prabir for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.